today we're going to dive into functions. Um, yeah. This one was for me the most interesting so far. It was really great. I did learn so much. It was amazing. Yeah, I like the rearrangement of stuff, you know, that everything is a prefix, you know. That you can overwrite plus and something like this. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, there's there's something uh, in the, I think when they start in the book, when they start getting into um, into S3, where they're saying that S3 is basically, you know, it doesn't it doesn't limit you in, in what you can do, which is gives people that are used to something like Java, you know, makes gives them the willies. Um, and I feel like this is kind of the same thing. Like R often lets you, you know, shoot yourself in the foot. You just have to not, not do that. Yeah, I like um, that term. Um... I don't know, like in you know, R, they said everything that um, happens is a function call. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, that's something exciting for me. So, everything that it happens is a function call. Um, so, it is that why R is like functional programming. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I like that, that everything kind of simplifies down. You know, like everything's an object, everything that happens is a function call. Yeah. Um, and you know, if if you kind of like work back through stuff, you, that can be that can be helpful. I feel like that's something yeah. that ends up. You know, I I missed that for a bunch of years when I was learning R because it didn't I didn't need it. You know, but I'd wonder why things uh -huh. were the way they were. And you know, this is nice because now I, you can kind of see what happens. Yeah, but I was wondering why um, um those kind of um um different kind of function like infix, prefix, and postfix stuff like um, the default one people understand do is like prefix, right? Uh, say that again. Um, different kind of functions, um, uh, prefix, infix, and stuff like that. Um, I mean, I find it difficult to understand where I can use the other kind of structure of the function which are not prefix or infix, stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the, yeah, I mean, I, I haven't, other than for fun, I haven't defined a, another, you know, form of a function to actually use in my code. But, you know, you look at something like Mag Magritter, and I think it's implemented in C, but it's essentially done with, you know, because you can define new infix operators. And that's why it has the, you know, anytime you see an operator that has the percent around it, um, mm -hmm. I think in might be an exception. In is in base R, I think, but um, a lot of those are, you know, defined in whatever package. It's just it's kind of cool that you can do that. You know, I was talking to a Python person the other day, and you know, you, you really, it's really difficult to define an infix operator, and even when you do, it's kind of a hack. Um, so it's kind of neat that R lets you, you know. Yeah, uh, I think we uh, make a call, Roman. It's already time. Uh, so today um, we're gonna have uh, chapter five, right? Um, functions um, gonna be led by Brett. Um, and next week is gonna be Adrian will take us to environment chapter. Um, so today, Brett, um, it's up to you. So you can please introduce yourself a bit and yeah, drive the ship. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm Brett. Um, I work at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution um, in Massachusetts in the U.S. Um, I mostly do uh, accelerator mass spectrometry, but I do a lot of data work and I've always used R for that. Um, so it's just been, you know, for the amount of time I've been learning R, I don't feel very advanced, but it's really kind of good now to, um, to learn more stuff and see how R works behind the scenes. Um, I also want to say that the uh, um, I, I uh, ruthlessly stole a lot of stuff from past presentations from the other cohorts. Uh, so I wanted to thank them um, even for um, making me finally learn um, Zeringen, Zeringen themer, which I've been meaning to learn for a while and a little bit of CSS. Um, and there's also a couple of things just kind of stolen directly from the chapter in here. So I just wanted to kind of acknowledge that. Um, that stuff is, is great for, even if you're not preparing a, a to present a chapter. The old presentations are fantastic, like especially the first couple of groups did a really good job with this. 
Um, okay. Okay, so uh, function fundamentals. Um, so they can be broken down to three components, um, the arguments of the function, the body and the environment. Um, and uh, so functions are objects, just as objects are a vector, everything in R is an object. Uh, before we started, we were talking about that, that quote that'll come up again later, that's uh, everything in everything that Every object, everything that exists in R is an, is an object. Everything that happens in R is a, is a function call. Um, and uh, sometimes in R you'll see functions called closures. Uh, this reflects the fact that they, the functions capture or enclose their environment. And this is really key for understanding uh, uh, object of type closure is not susceptible, which I still don't often understand why I get it, but I at least understand what it means now. Okay, so the parts of a function um, the formals are the list of arguments passed um, to a function. Qu question, um, Greg. Sure. Um, so you mean functions are called closure in another sense? Yeah. So um, I'm not enough of a computer scientist to know where that comes from, um, but I've seen that in other languages too, and I think it I think it has to do with yeah that how they how they connect to their environment. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, I think the most useful thing as, a, as an R coder is just to know that, that that's another word for a function. So when you see things involving closures, you know that you're talking about something happening with a function. Right. Um, um, okay, so the arguments are the, uh, or the formals are the list of arguments passed to a function. Uh, the body is the actual code that makes the function work. And the environment is the kind of space where a function finds its values uh, associated with the names that are used in the function. Um, and I, I've, I saw this little figure on the right uh, a couple weeks ago um, and somebody posted to a data science list. Um, I, I'm not sure if I, if it's a company that's kind of writing, uh, they're making data science kind of uh, um, prepackaged environments, um, which is neither here nor there, but I really like this, this diagram because it kind of shows that the key to reproducibility is these three things, whether it's for a function or whether it's for any part of our code. You know, once you have those three things the same, your result will be the same. Um, okay, so um, let's see. So primitive functions are, code, are functions written directly in C. Uh, they pretty much only exist in R base. And one thing that makes them tricky is that they have uh, null, um, null formals body and environment. Um, so you'll see this if you, you know, if you try to call the formals on a, on a uh, um, primitive function, you won't get anything back. Or I think you might get an error, I can't remember. Um, so they have a type of built-in or special. Um, things like sum and uh, um, the subset operator are, are, are um, example of that. Um, we'll see this notation down here with the back ticks around a, a special function uh, more a little bit later. It's a really useful one to know because it lets you do things with a special, special form function that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do to you know, get help on it or, or ask about it in a in different type of, um, okay. Uh, I'm not going to check the chat that often, but definitely feel free to break in if I'm um, okay. missing something or... Uh, May I break in? <laughs> sure. Okay. Can you go back to previous slide, please? Yeah. All right. So these primitive functions, um, like sum and stuff like that, um, they said they are not written in R, right? They are written in C. Yeah. Like so they're written... Yeah, the, so they're written in C, and I didn't dig too deeply into this, um, but one of the one of the past cohorts uh, um, kind of investigated whether it's the same thing as uh, RCPP, uh, that kind of writing a yeah. C function. And yeah, it's, it's not. So when this, you know, so like last week when we said that MAP was implemented in C, mm -hmm. it is, but it's but it's still not a primitive function. Um, and I'm not, I'm a little fuzzy on the difference, but there it's a kind of different way of doing it. Okay. So um, my understanding what like they said is written in C directly. I was thinking like, um, how um, are they um, translated to R? Um, um, how do they interact with R code if um, we call them? I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. I don't know a heck of a lot about um, either form of writing in C, but I, I definitely, yeah, I don't know how it's, how it's implemented. Um, right. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. 
All right, so uh, creating functions. So everybody's done this a bunch, so this is um, definitely a review. Um, there are objects like all things in R. Um, you name it during um, by assigning it while you're creating it, just like any other object. Or object. Um, the bracket form that we all probably learned first is is uh, the brackets are really only to tell it that it's a code block, just like in I think just like in C. Um, so it can be written functions can be written either with or without the out the brackets. Um, so the the function object that you're creating, just like any other object, doesn't need to be named. You can use it directly. Uh, so that's where anonymous functions come from. Um, so the way you create an anonymous function R is you just don't bind it to a name. Um, so the use of this is most often in functional programming, where you have a, a function like the apply family that takes a data and a function, um, and the function just has to be a really simple thing that it can pass the data into one thing at a time. Um, so if you have something that's a little more complicated that has a couple of functions chained together, you can do it with an anonymous function. Um, and that way, um, L, uh, sorry, um, L apply is feeding elements of empty cars into as X into this uh, one at a time. And it doesn't need to worry about having this kind of more complex form over here. Um, and the other examples are pretty much the same thing. Um, it's worth noting that uh, um, uh, I just noticed in the in the chat it is it is exactly lambda in Python. Um, so uh, at, with Python, um, you often use a map with a lambda function, and it's the, it's the same thing. Uh, it's a really common kind of functional programming um, paradigm. Um, and I learned that you can put functions into a list, which is kind of cool. Um, I need to think about how to use this, but this seems really neat. You can um, essentially assign the functions to a uh, named member of a list and then call them by their named member. Um, so here we're saying that uh, um, half halves what you feed into it double doubles it. And we're putting that into a, a list called funds. So you can call funds double uh, just as if it was a, a normal function. So I'm assuming this works with other kind of creative ways of naming things in R. Uh, I haven't tried it, but it's kind of just neat you know, again, going back to that everything is a is an object and, and can be treated as an object. Yeah, um, so um, uh, using this function in a list, I, I just saw an example using target function, target package um, for use for modeling. And um, they use this kind of concept where you create a list and put a bunch of function inside and call them. Um, this is the nose. So I just saw it last week um, using this kind of structure in target function as well. Yeah, it's just, it was new to me and it's kind of neat. Um, okay. Um, all right, so uh, so calling functions. So again, one of the most basic things in R, just function with the arguments uh, in parentheses. Uh, we'll talk about the other other function forms a little bit later. Uh, you can also call functions with the, the, do, the do call function. Um, and that's uh, just a function that uh, um, takes a function name and takes a list of arguments and runs that function with uh, with these with the arguments in the second uh, second parameter. Um, I have a question. So this do the call is only used um, if you have the argument is a list. I think so. I would assume that if you just have one argument, you could do it without it. Um, yeah, I mean. I've seen do call used a lot, but I've never really needed to use it in my in my own code. So I haven't really paid much attention to what it does for you. Um, I mean, I do it sometimes with R bind, so with base, when I have a list of data frames or something, and then you can do call R bind and then the list and then- Ah, okay. Yeah, so you can define that list outside of the function, outside of the do call call. Okay. All right. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip over the exercises on the on the run through, but I, I'm hoping we'll have a little bit of time at the end to look at them. Um, I thought they were kind of interesting for this chapter, some like kind of you know deciphering complicated codes. That was kind of fun. Okay, so uh, so function compositions, combining multiple functions together, um, essentially chaining functions. Um, so there are two ways to do this in base R. Um, the uh, nested form where um, the mean function is returning into the, the first argument of the square root function and the square roots operating on what mean returns. Um, 
A uh, clearer but less concise way to do this is with intermediate variables. Um, it also means that you need to establish intermediate variables, which is, um, unless you actually need them for something else, can be a little messy. Uh, so here we're assigning the result of mean to out, and then we're operating um, on, we're running square root on the result of that mean that was put into the out variable. Um, and then everybody's favorite uh, R innovation, which has been around for probably about 40 or 50 years, um, the pipe. Um, it, so it reads left to right, like uh, um, like many of us read English. So it tends to be very readable. Um, it puts focus on what's happening, the, um, the functions themselves, uh, rather than the objects being operated on the noun. So you're saying, I have this noun, do these things in a chain to it. Um, so we're saying, I have this noun of this uh, sequence, uh, take the mean of those numbers of that vector, and then uh, uh, take the square root of that vector. So it's very easy to read as if it were English. Um, a comparison of the methods, uh, nesting is concise, but it's hard for humans to read. It gets really complex when you have you know, more than two or three um, functions nested. Um, naming is clear and it's useful when you need the intermediates, but it's kind of a, um, it's, it's not very concise um, and it's kind of wasteful of uh, time to generate those, those named objects um, if you don't need it. Um, so piping is very readable, but it, only, but it only works for linear transformation chains, like where you're returning one thing you need to operate on and you need to operate on a single thing. Um, and it also requires an external package, which is sometimes not ideal, especially if you're writing a package. Um, I don't okay. think this one's in the Twitter. Oh, sorry, okay. there's somebody. Is, is that named after a person? I'm just reading the, uh, the previous slide there. Oh, uh, the, um, yeah, the Magritte package is named after uh, um, René Magritte. I'm probably horribly mispronouncing that. He was a, a French kind of surrealist artist, I think in the, um, I don't know exactly when, but I think in like the mid 1900s. And he's kind of famous for this, uh, this sentence that means uh, this is not a pipe. Um, so it's kind of like somebody as humor took that as the name for this package. Um, and I'm not sure if there's I'm not sure if there's a functional connection between the two, but I always kind of like that. That's you know kind of an interesting name for the package. Um, okay, so scoping. Um, I am very not good at scoping, other than um, like they mentioned in the chapter, uh, the kind of internalized way that everybody knows how scoping works. So hopefully I'm I'm not going to get any of this wrong. But if I do, please uh, chime in and correct me. Um, so R is lexically scoped, um, and what that so okay so scoping in general is is where a function knows to look for named objects so what environment can the code use to find what it needs to operate um so uh lexical scoping um is the type that r uses and it's uh it looks up the values of the names based on how a function is defined rather than how it's called back in um, this i found a few that would be very um so yeah, so we have a, a 10 being assigned to X, and then we have a function that doesn't take any arguments. We're assigning uh, X to the, uh, we're assigning X 20 to X in the function, and then we're returning X. So everybody kind of intrinsically knows, or, or know, from using R knows that this will return 20 rather than 10. And that's because the function takes the value of X when it, when it defines the function or when it evaluates that function rather than when it, uh, um, you know, it doesn't take it from the global environment when when it runs when it runs the function. Um, okay, so R has four basic scoping rules. There's name masking, uh, functions versus variables, uh, the concept of a fresh start when starting an, um, a new iteration of a function or a new uh, yeah, and uh, dynamic lookup. So I'll go through these one at a time. So name masking. Um, the, the rule for this is that it uses the names defined inside a function first. So the function, so the function is masking the internal environment with the names that it defines internally. Um, if it's missing a, a name within the function definition, it looks one level up, so up to the, the global environment um, or into the environment of the function above it if it's being called by another function. Um, so in the global environment, we're defining x to be one and z to be zero. Um, in a function where we're taking no, no parameters, we're assigning uh, y to be two and z to be three. So you can see that x is only defined in the global environment, 
y is only defined in the function and z is defined in both places. Um, so when you're returning x, y, and z, um, r says, okay, there's no x in the function. We're going to look at look in the global environment and the value of that is one. Um, for y, that's defined in the function, so we can use that. And for z, it's defined in both places, but we only care about the one that's defined within the function. Um, okay, so I, I call this one the object type. So R, R cares about um, what the name, what's defined by the name, or what, what, what kind of object is defined by the name when it's, when it's deciding whether to use a name defined within the function or, or out of the function. Um, so, so let's see. So in this, in this example, we're defining a function where uh, um, uh, the value of x is at, added to 100. Uh, then we're defining another function where um, 10 is assigned to this name geo9, which we've already named a function as up here. Um, and then we're saying geo9 of geo9. Um, so what's happening here is, and then we're returning, uh, we're calling g10 and seeing what comes back and we're getting 110. So what's happening here is that that first geo9, um, even though it's even though geo9 is defined within the function and the, the first rule would say, okay, we need to use this one, R knows that it can't call number 10. And it knows that it's not a it's not a function that can be called, it's not a closure. Um, so it looks one level up, says, okay, I'm gonna use this geo9. Um, that geo9 says uh, um, take geo9, take what's fed to it and, and add 100. So in this case, it's saying, okay, well, I now I have a name geo9 that has the value 10, I can operate on that. So I'll use this one here. So we're getting 110 as the output. Um, okay, and the fresh start one is, is pretty straightforward. Um, it's uh, essentially just each time you, each time you, uh, um, you instantiate a, a function call, um, that function gets a nice clean environment to work with. Um, it, it defines things uh, with with that current iteration of the function, or that current, um, yeah. Um, so in this function, we're saying, okay, well, if a doesn't exist, uh, make a equal to one, um, and then return a. So if a does exist, we're going to say uh, um, a plus one assigned to a. Um, so if we call it the first time, as you'd expect in a clean environment, you the function a doesn't exist, so a equals one. We return a, we get one. Um, so now in the extern in the global environment, we're testing whether A exists. It does not because it was only defined in that function and doesn't get defined in the global environment. Uh, when we call that again, um, if we're using the same environment, when we call the function a second time, you'd expect that A would be defined and that the value returned would be two because you're getting, you're getting uh, uh, one plus one equals two, um, but it's not, which means that we're getting a, a fresh environment when we start. Um, I see people mentioning recursion in the chat. I've, I've, that's always blows my mind. Um, we can maybe talk about that later, but the, uh, um, you know, even like the Fibonacci example, I, I, I can never wrap my head around unless I think about it for a long time and then I lose it half an hour later. Um, okay, uh, so um, the final way that uh, um, R knows where to look for, named, for names is uh, dynamic lookup. Um, and this one, I'm a little confused why this is different than the naming rules. Um, sorry, than the uh, the first rule. Um, so R won't look for names or values until the function is run. Um, so when you combine that with name masking, you can get some unexpected behavior. So so what's happening here is you're defining a function that's uh, um, x plus one with no parameters. You're defining x15 in the global environment um, and then calling the function. Um, it's going to find x in the global environment and it's going to add one to it so we get 16. That makes sense. Um, so now we're defining x to be 20 um, and we're running that function again um, and we're now getting 21 as you'd expect. So I think what dynamic lookup means is that um, the value of x is uh, evaluated when the function is called. So whatever the last time that x was assigned will be what you get. Um, okay. So, um, any questions on that part before I move on to the lazy evaluation stuff?
seeing lots of recursion talk in the chat. Um, and yeah. then <clears throat> one thing, I uh, smart. <clears throat> you you cannot uh, disable the lookup or uh, the. Did you know any option? Because this this lookup often brings also problems for me if you have a uh, a variable the same name so it's sometimes really uh yeah like you know for that final dynamic lookup one the 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 bad examples if you have a typo in your function and you end up getting a value from your environment it can be really confusing to find that because there's nothing yeah, exactly. you know, there's, there's no error there's no you, you can only tell you have to trace back the values to figure out you know where it was getting that from so that can be a really confusing one uh, i don't know a way to to change the evaluation rules I'm not sure if that's if you can do that in order or not. Um, okay, so uh, lazy evaluation. Um, it's this is another one that I'm a little hazy on, um, but it's it's one of our strengths that things. So R R doesn't evaluate um, arguments until they're needed in a function, um, and it generally doesn't evaluate anything until it's actually needed for a computation or for it to be evaluated for the where R is in the code. Um, so the way this works with functions is that R evaluates arguments when they're accessed within the function. Um, so for instance, if we have a function um, that takes a, uh, takes a parameter X and it just returns 10 and we give uh, stop, this is an error as the parameter, um, R just returns 10 because it doesn't actually, it doesn't evaluate this. It doesn't, um, it doesn't care what X is because X isn't actually used within the function. Um, So how this works is uh, a system called Promises, uh, which I extra don't understand very well, but is uh, I think we're going to talk about later in the book. Um, so uh, Promises, it's a data structure that powers lazy evaluation. Um, so Promises have these three components. It's an expression, um, an environment to evaluate the expression in, and evaluated that's com a, a value that's computed and cached when the promise is accessed. So um, You'll have this kind of sitting here, um, ready to be evaluated, but it doesn't it doesn't get run until it needs to be, um, and it's only run once the first time it's needed. Um, so yeah, so this kind of plays into how lazy evaluation works with a couple of, of functional of things with functions. Um, so for default arguments, so uh, lazy evaluation enables default values for parameters to be defined in terms of other arguments or objects defined later in the function body. Um, and this is like, this is like recursion to me. It gets kind of confusing to look at, but, um, so, okay. So what's happening here? So we're defining a function with, uh, um, these parameters and th that each have a default value. Um, and one of the vault default values is expressed in terms of names. Um, so here inside the function, we're assigning a to be 10 and B to be 100. And so when you run this function, R doesn't know what Z is uh, because it doesn't have values defined for A and B, but it's not, it's not, it's not throwing an error be at, or, and it's also not looking in the global environment because it's gonna wait until it needs that Z parameter within the function to evaluate it. So because A and B are, are defined or named within the function, by the time you get to actually returning the value of X, Y, and Z, it can say, okay, now I can evaluate this. I can say that A plus B is 110, so Z equals 110. And we can see down here that we've gotten um, one, um, one times two and uh, 10 plus 100 for the output. Um, so, you know, like a lot of the more complex things in this chapter, the, they have a place and they have a value, but if you don't need them, they can be Things, things that are hard to read when you're, when you're coding, if, there, if there's an easy way around them that doesn't involve that hard to read form, it's better to use the, the easier to understand form. Um, so missing arguments is kind of a good example of that. So um, the missing function R will tell you whether the user supplied a parameter or whether you got it from the default. So if missing is true, it means that uh, the user did not supply the parameter that you're, that you're, uh, that you're asking about. Um, so, yeah, so here we have a function where we're saying uh, the default of x is 10. Um, if we're missing, if we're missing x, return return missing x. So that's going to be true if nobody supplied x and false if 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 it was supplied. 
Um, so if you just execute this without a value, you get true. If you execute it um, with a value, you get false. So uh, where this is used a lot is uh, to tell uh, whether the you know so whether the user gave a, a necessary argument. So in uh, the sample function, um, you can see that you know if I were to if I were to just look at this function, I'd say okay, well I need to feed in um, my uh, my vector to sample. I need to feed in the the size, which I assume is the size of the of the sample, and um, whether to sample with replacement and and the rest of it. Um, but actually, size is not required, and if you don't give it, um, sample uses the length of uh, uses the length of the of the vector supply that you want to sample uh, to determine size. So it'll the size if you don't give it a, a a size to sample, it'll sample the entire vector. Um, so this is a really kind of cool way to do this, but um, when you're reading that the definition of that function until you read down into it, you won't really get that size is, isn't a required um, um, isn't isn't or isn't a required parameter. So you can see that uh, uh, Hadley rewrote it as uh, size equals null, and that kind of gives you the gives you the clue that you don't need to supply size. Um, okay, and uh, um, I think the lazy boolean thing is clear is uh, is kind of cool, so I put it in here. Um, this is not really strictly lazy evaluation in the sense that we've been talking about. I don't think it's done exactly the same way, but it's uh, um, so booleans are also only evaluated as needed. So uh, if the left-hand side of a of an AND comparison is false, R doesn't bother with the right-hand side because it, it knows that it can't possibly return true, so it just returns false. Um, and similar thing happens with OR. Uh, if the left side of an OR is true, it'll return true because it knows, okay, whatever happens on the right-hand side, um, it's true. So you can you can use this to kind of short circuit for something that um, if you're testing for something and there's an easy test and a hard test, um, do the easy test first because then it won't evaluate the hard test and take a lot of time doing that if the easy test has answered your question. Um, okay, I'm gonna uh, pause there for a second uh, between sections. I'm just gonna read some chat stuff. Um, Oh yeah, I like the quantum state thing for promises. You, you can't manipulate uh, promises because they just are what they are. Um, and then no, I didn't fully understand it either, but um, yeah, I think that it's that you have the, you have the statement to evaluate, you have the environment to evaluate it in, but once you've looked at that promise, it has to evaluate the statement. So you can't, you know, so that kind of, I could be getting this wrong, but I think that kind of defeats the, um, yeah, it kind of like defeats the promise, I guess. I don't know if that's a good way to say that. Um, ooh, cool, recursion examples. Um, oh yeah, I like, I like uh, Hannah's uh, explanation much better than mine. Um, okay. Any other any other questions before I move on? Um, I still don't understand. I'm trying to understand the Hannes um, explanation of this quantum state. Um, I don't know what bring quantum state into R. <laughs> yeah. Um, so even if it is, I don't like. I mean, I mean, I find it difficult to believe. I mean, quantum state of uh, stuff. Um, so um, uh, can you explain it a bit more, or Hannes can explain it a bit more? I mean, what's what's the example with the cat and the box? What, yeah. what's the fish? That, that's yeah. That I mean, that's it. It's you have a box and you don't know what's in there. And if you want to look at it, you, you know it more or less. But, <laughs> but for the moment, it it could be everything more or less. Okay. Yeah. So is it like so with the with the uh, with the cat thing? Like you could imagine that you have a. a a promise that's going to evaluate a true or false statement. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And then, I mean, if you look it, at it, if you if you look at that promise, it needs mm -hmm. to evaluate whether it's true or false in order to, to tell you what. Okay. It's By doing that, it's no longer a promise. Yeah. I, I mean, the whole 
Chroma I think is very common in asynchronous uh, programming languages. And I do a lot of uh, TypeScript and JavaScript and there everything more or less is a promise. So you have to evade sometimes. There's really a, before the variable you have to write evade that you have to evade till the promise is fulfilled and then you can go on. And so, so you can, so the code is not written from uh, one from top to bottom. It's more or less, it can be asynchron, can run, and it doesn't need to wait till one line is evaluated. So yeah, uh, probably my English isn't good enough to explain it, but yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So, okay, dot, dot, dot. Um, this is kind of a fun one. Um, dot, dot, dot allows uh, any number of arguments to be passed. Um, and one of the really cool uses of that is to pass these along to another function. Um, I'm trying to remember the, the term for it in the text. It was a, it was a good one. It, it's kind of, I think it's kind of like the, well, anyway. Um, so, all right. So if you want to pass many arguments, um, so sum essentially uses, the sum function essentially uses this to add objects together. Um, so if I'm going to, if I sum, um, the, the vector one, the vector two, and the vector three, it's exactly the same thing as making a vector out of one, two, and three and running some on it. Um, so, and I can pass any number of, of little bits into some, and it'll try to add them all together. It's like this, the same idea as paste. Um, and, you know, I have an asterisk here because not really because sum's a primitive, so it's not actually written in R, so it's not using the dot, dot, dot directly. Um, but you can write functions that do this. Um, yeah, the var args thing or variadic. I like that way of referring to it. Is, does anyone know if this is the same thing as like the uh, um, the args and kw args in Python? Is it, is it the same idea? Okay. Um, okay. So uh, um, one of the cool uses of dot 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 is when you're writing when you're writing functions to uh, you know deal with plotting or deal with um, doing things with another function you don't actually have to um, you don't have to mimic all all of the all of the parameters that you're going to send to the other function um, in your in your parameter definition in the function you're writing. So here we're saying okay well um, let, let's make a red plot um, we'll take it we'll take some data. And we'll take whatever else you want to want to throw at it. Um, so then, um, inside the function, we're saying, okay, take the x and y that are defined, um, make the plot, make the points red in the plot, and then pass in whatever uh, whatever other parameters were were given to the the parent function. Um, so when we do this, and we uh, um, say, you know, give it some some uh, label titles. Um, those appear, so they're passed through to the plot function and put onto the um, put onto the plot. Um, okay. So function exits um, in R, a function returns a value if it's successful and an error if it's not. Um, so here's a you know simple function that squares a squares a number. Uh, if I give it a number, it'll square it. If I tell it to square a word. Um, I haven't told it how to do that, and R doesn't know how to um, how to do that by default, so it returns an error. Um, and okay, so uh, um, I think probably everybody's familiar with explicit and implicit returns. Um, this is the reason why I always have to run all of my Python code at least twice because I always forget the return statement at the end. Um, and so implicit returns are saying, okay, well, whatever the last Whatever the last value that's that's calculated in a function, whatever the last the last thing that's evaluated in a function that's not assigned to a name, return that. Um, and an explicit return is is saying, okay, use the return statement to return this this object. Um, so we're probably all do this kind of uh, um, already, but um, use implicit returns when it's clear. It's just less typing, and it's you know for an R person, they know that it, when they see that last evaluated thing on a line, that that's what the what the function is going to return. Um, you can use ex explicit returns when, say, if you're using an if then statement and you need to return from some other point than the bottom of the function, um, or if even you know even if it's not that kind of 
um, branch structure, but if it's still not really clear where your return is coming from, adding that in will will let the reader know what what they're looking at. Um, you can make returns invisible, um, which uh, um, makes me worry because functional programming should always have a visual a visible return. Um, but of course, it's only one programming model, so we can do other things. Uh, so okay, so um, this function x uh, invisibly returns the um, sorry, the function f invisibly returns the, um, the, the value squared, x squared. So if we do f2, huh, there's no return. Go figure, we told the return to be, return to be invisible. But if we run the function and, and uh, name the return or name the, the value returned by the function, um, it actually has run and given us the, the uh, two squared. Um, so in general, these function, you should use this invisible uh, you should make the return visible when uh, the side effect is what you're looking for. Um, so side effect meaning um, the like the assign the side effect of, of assignment. Um, I, I meant to apologize for this in the beginning, but I, I used a ligature font. I really like it, but sometimes um, it, people are like, "Wow, it's, what's an arrow?" But it's um, it's the assignment arrow. Um, so things like assignment, um, you don't want to return from an assignment. You just want to assign it to something. Uh, likewise with with print, you don't want print to to return something, you want it to print something to the to the console um, and plot similarly. Um, so, um, okay. Um, so if a function can't, uh, can't work as you want it to, you should have it throw an error. Um, so if my uh, x squared function is not getting, not getting a numeric, um, throw an error that you can't square that. Um, this is a very specific return for a very specific input, but um, obviously they should be more general in practice. Um, so exit handling. Um, this is another thing I was a little fuzzy on. I was, I was working through this example and I think it finally made sense to me, but uh, so in any case, so an exit handler is something that executes when a function, when a function finishes, regardless of whether the function has an error or not. Um, and the main purpose of this is to um, set things back to how they were. If you've changed anything that the that ending the function won't set back, you should use on exit to to fix that. Uh, so in my example function here, um, I'm saying that when the when the function exits, um, I should uh, uh, print hello to the um, to the console. Um, this add true. It's recommended always to use this because this means that if you have multiple on exit calls. Um, it will will uh, kind of concatenate them together. It won't just execute the first one and exit. It'll say, okay, well, I have the second on exit. I'll have to run that too and do what it, it asks me to do as well as the first one. Um, and that can, it's, even if you only have one, it's recommended to use it because if you add another one later and don't notice that you already had one, that can cause kind of weird problems. Um, okay, so, uh, um, so if X is false, uh, we want to throw an error that says hello. Um, and if it's not, we want to say, uh, you say goodbye and I say. So if I run my function with uh, x equals true, um, I get, you say goodbye and I say hello. Uh, if I run it with false, um, I get, uh, um, sorry, I get uh, um, hello as the, as the error and then uh, Hello with an exclamation point as the on exit. That's still ex that's still executed even though there's a um, even though there's a um, even though the function returned with an error. Um, okay. So functions can change their global environment. Um, this again is like you know not something you want to do often with a if you're trying to code in functional style, but sometimes it's really useful. Um, so. Um, Unless the goal of your function is to uh, is to change the environment, the global environment, and not change it back, uh, so like options, for instance, um, you should change it back when exiting. And uh, on exit um, is the uh, is the way to do that. Um, okay. Um, so any any questions? Okay. 
Um, all right. So function forms, um, we we're kind of talking about this a little bit at the beginning. I think it's it's kind of cool how everything is is really just a prefix function. So anyway, so this uh, this statement by John Chambers is a really kind of cool one for understanding R. Uh, to understand computations in R, two slogans are helpful. Everything that exists is an object and everything that happens is a function call. Um, so this is kind of like this way of, I, I like it because it's a way of doing the language that's a very, kind of makes everything simple. So it's, you can trace everything back to one of these two things. Um, so there are four ways of calling a function. Uh, prefix is the one we're most most familiar with that we've seen all through this all through this chapter. Uh, the name of the function precedes the argument. Um, an infix function, um, the the uh, function name comes between the arguments. Um, a replacement function uh, replace values by assignment. And special functions are things like the uh, um, the list subset operator, um, things that we typically think of as keywords like if and for that we'll see a little later are actually not keywords. They're they're other functions in R. Um, so they're just functions called in a, in a special form. Um, okay, so how do we how do we know that all of these are 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 really just prefix functions that are you know kind of created a little bit differently? Uh, all functions can be rewritten to prefix form. So uh, for an infix function, like, uh, like the, uh, the add operator, um, if you surround it by backticks, you can use it as a prefix function. Um, and again, this is super useful if you wanna operate on um, a function. So say, you know, if you wanna get help on plus or help on bracket, if you surround it by these backticks, it'll actually, you, you can treat that name as something that you can understand rather than, than an infix function. Um, so, okay, and replacement. Um, so like the, the names function. So uh, adding names to a vector here. Um, if we rewrite that with an assignment arrow after it and surrounded by backticks, it can now be used as a, as a prefix form. So it takes the, um, the object to operate on and um, the vector of names to add to that, to that object. Um, <clears throat> okay, and special form things like um, things like for or you know for in. Um, if we surround that with backticks, you can um, you can call it as a as a normal prefix function with the um, the um, iterate iterator the uh, um, iteration I guess um, the vector to iterate over or the object to iterate over um, and what to do while iterating. Yeah, I have a question, Greg. Sure. Um, so what is the excess of, I mean, in practical science, what is the excess of writing in this form that we may find it difficult to understand? Is there any specific um, way in which we need to write our code that needs this form? Yeah, I mean, we we're, you know, we were talking about that earlier too. Like I've never, you know, other than playing around, I've never written an infix operator. Um, you know, they, they, you can think of situations where they're super useful. Like, uh, um, I think we were talking about the, um, the pipe operators being one of those. That's, that's um, at some place within the Mercator package that's defined, um, again, it might be, might be written in C, so it may not actually be done this way. But um, if it were done in R, it would be done um, with this infix notation. So that's one place where it's really useful. Um, you know, because of the kind of, paradigm of the, the kind of data stuff that I think a lot of us do from day to day. We don't, we don't really need infix operators that much, or it's not, it's often not useful to define them. Um, but I think it's just like, you know, again, it's kind of like really neat to me that um, the language that R simplifies to this prefix form, um, you know, like if we had to write four statements every day like this, it would, you know, we'd get used to it, but it would, it would still feel weird. Um, Whereas this one is, you know, very familiar and it, and it kind of is easier to read. So, yeah, if anybody, if anybody thinks of, you know, times that they've used, you know, they created an infix operator or replacement or, or a special, that would be, be really cool to hear about in the chat or, uh, or just chat about. Um, I think Adrian, Adrian asked why the, um, oh yeah, that's a good one, uh, um, overriding the plus operator. Um, yeah, I think that's either, in, yeah, that's a good one. 
that's one thing that I, I miss in R about Python that you can just paste strings together with a plus. Um, and uh, um, Adrian asked uh, why the in disappears. I don't know exactly how that works. So I don't know how I would define, you know, so here's how you would call for as a prefix prefix form. But I don't know, I don't know how you'd write that such that it gets that the in is in there. Um, that's a good question. Okay, so uh, most of our time spent on the prefix form, so we can talk about that a little bit here, how the arguments are specified. Um, so positionally, uh, we can say, um, you know, like what the heck, we know that the first argument to it is what we want help on. Um, we can use partial matching. Um, so part, partial matching. So we can say help top equals mean, which of course I had to look up because I had to figure out what that meant. Um, so, and you can, um, you can specify arguments by name. So the, um, the topic to the topic um, argument in the help function, um, if you, you know, assign mean to that, then it'll, it'll get help on, on mean. Um, so best practice for this are, um, you wanna limit position matching to the first couple arguments because um, if you go too far out with that, it's hard to know what position you're in. Um, anytime you have to count, in my case, on my fingers, um, that's too much. Um, and you should avoid partial matching at all costs because as we've discussed earlier, partial matching is mostly evil. Um, and you know, like I said earlier, I would have thought that there was a parameter to help called top that I didn't know about, but in fact, it's doing partial matching for topic. Um, Okay, um, so infix functions. Uh, so again, backticks are your, are your friend. Um, so you can get help on any infix operator or any 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 function by using the, uh, the backticks around its name. Um, so you can create your own infix functions with uh, backticks and percent. Um, I don't know why R requires the percent, um, but it's just a it's a quirk of the language. Um, so we can define. Actually, this is exactly what uh, Hannes was just talking about. Um, so we can make a string concatenation operator um, by um, saying, okay, um, take, the, take the first parameter um, and paste it to the second parameter. Um, it's, it's, and then if we call uh, new space and then our, our function and then string, we'll get the concatenated string. Uh, it's worth noting that this is position dependent. So if I were to say um, um, either paste BA or uh, function ba, we'd get string new here. Um, so it's useful when you're writing one of these. Uh, replacement functions, uh, um, just like the um, calling them as a prefix, you can define them by putting a uh, assignment operator uh, after their name within backtex. Uh, so this function um, is named second and it takes um, a, a vector and a value. Um, <clears throat> and what it's going to do is it's going to assign that value to the second element of the vector that you pass in. Um, so if I were to say now, um, yeah, so then uh, to use it, uh, you place the function on the left side of the assignment. So I have a, a vector from one to 10. Um, I say um, run the second function on that vector um, with an integer five. And now if I look at X, we'll see that it's uh, uh, the second element is turned into a five. So it's, it's done our replacement. Um, okay, and uh, so the final thing is special forms. Um, you know, I can't imagine writing a special form for anything. Um, I don't think it's it's looked upon favorably often. I don't know of any packages that do this either. Maybe, maybe somebody knows of one. Um, but since everything's an object, uh, things we don't usually think of functions are just, are still just functions. Uh, so even function is a function. Um, so you can see here that um, I think I was reading through this and realizing that I think I forgot a comparison here. Um, I think that so this is our our normal way of calling of uh, calling a function, and this is the equivalent as a prefix operator, if I'm getting that right. And all of these parentheses and moving around of function names made me start thinking if R is really actually a Lisp. Uh, which makes me feel a little crazy, um, but I'm going to end it there. And if we wish to discuss whether R is a Lisp or not, we can. I don't know Lisp very well, so I'm not going to be very useful there. But all right. 
So that's the end of my, my prepared stuff. Cool. Yeah, I like the evil things you can do uh, with uh, um, with overriding operators. Okay. All right. Um. Thank. Right. Um. Any question? Um, that was an informative session. Um, thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks, Brett. Yeah, thanks for listening, guys. Um, I think next week we have um, Adrian Wright um, to take us to environment chapter. And uh, feel free, um, we have um, many chapters um, uh, and we need their volunteers. Um, so if you want to volunteer for any chapter, um, yeah, it's open and they can send me a message. And uh, yeah, all right. Um, I think um, today we finish, I think, in good time. Um, <laughs> like, um, though we have not looked at the exercise, but it's quite good. Oh, did anybody, did anybody have any questions on the, on the exercises? Now, for me, I personally didn't go even through the exercises, so <laughs> I don't have any question. But um, definitely, I will look after um, if I have any question, and I will post in the group. There, there's also um, in the um, in the repo for um, for the book club Advanced R. Um, there's also um, a a good um, sorry a good, a good thing that goes over the uh, the, the questions for the chapter. Um, at least most of them. It's kind of nice. Um, Thanks for posting your uh, Twitter handles um, to follow more. <laughs> okay, I will follow people as well. <laughs> <laughs> mine, mine is pretty boring. <laughs> well, maybe if you just share some pictures from Woods Hole, that would be a uh, sufficient Twitter, I think. <laughs> I think there might be a couple in there somewhere. All right, um, I think um, um, since there are no more questions, um, I think we can call it a day and um, see you guys next week and um, happy day to everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone.